Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the ministerial opening session of Wind Europe 2018, the conference that is part of this huge event here in Hamburg, the Global Wind Summit, the world's biggest event in wind energy this year. We're delighted as Wind Europe to be running this event jointly with our friends in Hamburg Messe and Congress. They are organizing the exhibition, and Wind Europe are organizing this conference. And we're delighted to have with us here this morning so many leading figures from the world of energy. The EU Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy, Miguel Arias Cañete. Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner, you have just brokered very recently the agreement on what will be the EU's target for renewables in 2030. And it's not going to be 27%, it is 32%. Thank you for that. You also played a key role, of course, in forging the historic Paris Climate Agreement back in 2015, and now you are focusing on delivering the EU's long-term decarbonisation strategy for 2050. Also with us this morning, we have the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, Dr. Fatih Birol. I'm sure you all... <laughs> I'm sorry, Fatih. I'm sure you all read the World Energy Outlook. You know that it is the Bible for energy data and analysis. Fatty, you are the benchmark. We all read what you say. So, of course, when you told us in the World Energy Outlook last year that soon after 2030, wind will be the number one source of electricity in Europe, we all took careful note, and we've all been repeating that ever since. So thank you very much for that. And then with us here this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we're also honoured to have the newly appointed Energy Minister of Norway, Mr. Kjell Freiberg. Minister, Norway is leading the way in corporate PPAs between wind farms and energy intensive installations in Norway, such as large aluminium smelters. That is going to drive huge expansion of onshore wind in Norway, and now you are starting to develop offshore wind. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, this is in an oil and gas rich country. Minister, we're delighted to have you with us. Also with us this morning, we have the Energy Minister of Denmark, Lars Christian Lilleholt. Denmark, of course. <laughs> Denmark, of course, is the cradle of wind energy. No country in the world has a higher share of wind in its electricity mix, now over 40%. And over the weekend, it was even over 100% of Denmark's electricity mix. Also with us here this morning, we're delighted to have the Directors General for Energy from both the government of Germany, Torsten Herden, and from the government of Austria, Michael Lorsch. Austria, of course, currently have the presidency of the European Union. And finally, we are delighted to be able to introduce to you Markus Bayra, who is the Director General of Europe's main industry lobby, Business Europe. Marcus, it's the first time anyone from Business Europe has ever spoken at the opening of a Wind Europe conference. So we are truly honored to have you with us. It shows that you recognize that our industry is a key part of manufacturing and jobs and wealth creation in Europe. It shows also that you recognize the potential that wind energy offers to your own members, the industrial consumers of electricity. We're delighted to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our lineup of speakers here this morning. Before we start our keynote speeches, I'm delighted to introduce to you our partner for this event, the CEO and Chairman of Hamburg Messe and Congress, Mr. Bernd Aufderheider. Bernd, the floor is yours. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm pleased to welcome you to the biggest gathering of the global wind industry here at the exhibition complex at Hamburg Messe. The entrances to our exhibition halls have been open since 9 o'clock, and visitors are flocking to the exhibitor stands of Wind Energy Hamburg and to Wind Europe Conference. At the world's leading wind industry expo, more than 1,400 countries, companies from 40 countries are showcasing their novelties in the, of the entire wind industry, both onshore and offshore. The massive exhibit, you may have seen it on the plaza outside our building, the Lagerway Climbing Crane, is an impressive example of the industry's innovative power, especially when it comes to cost efficiency. As such, this temporary landmark speaks for the entire Wind Summit. Together with our partner Wind Europe and its world-class conference program, we are highlighting the industry's global core topics. Together, the, uh, these two top-ranking events are a perfect match. For four information-packed days, ladies and gentlemen, they will offer you great opportunities to learn, to network, and to do business on a global scale. The extraordinary importance of wind energy for the world's power needs, as well as climate protection, is beyond all question. The industry is making giant strides in overcoming its core challenge to further reduce the levelized cost of electricity while opening up new markets. I have no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, that this high-profile gathering of energy experts from more than 100 countries will further drive the energy transition towards achieving a decarbonized energy supply infrastructure. A walk to our nine, through our nine exhibition halls, ladies and gentlemen, will give you an idea of the enormous variety of solutions, products, and services the wind industry offers today. At this event, you will learn everything you want to know about the state of the technology development and about digitalization within the industry. This is where industry visitors can find tangible wind power, and I hope you all will gain plenty of truly inspiring insights and get some new ideas when attending some of the many workshops and panel discussions of the conference program. I wish this Global Wind Summit great success, and for all of you, have a good day and good time here in Hamburg. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Director General for Energy in the German government, Torsten Herdan. Yeah, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Germany and specifically, of course, welcome to Hamburg. Um, we are very delighted uh, to see the world community on wind gathering together at these times where some people talk about critical times. And um, I would like to have a positive message coming out from this uh, Global Wind Summit this week in Hamburg. I think that is very important what we need. Uh, it's very much upon people if you send positive messages or if you are a little bit in between. And at least I have the impression when uh, talking yesterday to people and also the weeks before that there is some sort of negative tendency. And uh, I think this is a very good opportunity uh, to break with this and send clear positive messages. And uh, let me perhaps give you two examples uh, in which areas I do see that the positive messages uh, can be sent very easily. We are entering into a sort of second phase in the wind energy. The first phase was uh, to develop the technology to bring down costs, uh, to have deployment all over the world, not uh, in countries only like Denmark and Germany, the two starting countries, but in all countries around the world. That is done. Costs are down dramatically, very much competitive, even better than other conventional sources, uh, like Fatih always says with the IAA. But the challenges in front of us is that uh, still the wind energy is delivering energy when wind is blowing. And we now have to enter into the phase that we combine this with flexibility, whatever that is. It may be storage at the one point side, it may be grids, it may be um, demand side management, but we have to think as producers of wind turbines and in a system approach. And I think we have shown that this is possible in many, many cases, but still a lot of politicians don't believe in that. They don't believe in that and they have the opinion that uh, we have to substitute the base load on coal and gas with another base load. And that is something which is not true. 
And I think it's very important that we send the message with all that innovations uh, that we have those, call it hybrid packages, or whatever you will call it, in order to submit reliable power from wind energy. So that is one important message I would like to see to send uh, from this uh, uh, week of Global Wind Summit. The other message is that uh, production and infrastructure has to go together. Why do I say that? I don't say that because I feel that uh, wind energy has to follow the grid. But without any grid, wind energy is useless because then you produce something which you cannot deliver to the customer. We have a lot of problems with that in Germany, you know that, and other countries also have it. So what we have to do, we have to think in production and energy infrastructure. And if I'm talking about energy infrastructure, I'm talking about electric grid, I'm talking about gas grid, gas storage, and I'm talking about heat grids and also charging infrastructure. So either we are going to think those infrastructures together and then we will have the possibility for wind energy to be supplied not only to the electricity sector but also to the building sector, to the transport sector and to the industry sector or we are failing. And know that there is a lot of innovation there and I know that uh, walking through the uh, halls uh, you will see that all the time but you have to send that message out that wind energy is capable to cope with this energy infrastructure and that this builds together. And I think at the end of the day also a very good message would be that, uh, and I said that when I was a member of the supervisory board of Wind Europe some years ago, that wind and natural gas then becoming green gas are natural friends. And let's send us this message and then I think we are pretty well off uh, and we get convinced all the politicians which, which may at that point of time still have some question marks or doubts whether wind is the right way to go. It is, and you can show that this week. I wish you all success. Thank you very much. The world is transitioning all around us. Our energy system is transitioning from fossil fuels to a decarbonized, more decentralized and digitalized energy supply. Our wider society is changing too. People want prosperity and security, but they see an uncertain world. They worry they're losing control and that future generations will be less well off. Energy is pivotal to all these challenges. People want their energy to be clean, reliable and affordable. Wind provides that. It's the cheapest form of new power generation in most of Europe. It's local and it brings jobs, growth and revenue to local communities, often to rural or deprived areas. But wind has only just begun. We're now 12% of Europe's electricity and rising, but electricity is only 24% of Europe's energy. Transport, heating and industrial processes are still largely powered by fossil fuels. If we're serious about decarbonisation, that's got to change. How? Well, wind is already powering data centres. It'll soon be powering aluminium smelters, chemical plants, steel mills and car factories. We're working to get wind into heating systems and smart appliances and to drive the electrification of transport. We're breaking new ground. Our technology is breaking new ground too. Turbines are getting larger and more flexible. Europe now has the world's first floating offshore wind farm, and we're working on joint projects with storage and solar power. We're breaking new ground geographically. Wind is taking off in places we didn't reach before, like Egypt and elsewhere in Africa, the Middle East, Russia. We're reaching new corners of Latin America. And in all these places, and of course in China and India, wind is bringing growth and prosperity. Breaking new ground means other things too. It means unleashing the potential of data science and material science to reduce costs and extend the lifetime of wind farms. It means new business models, finding new ways of financing wind as we move towards a more merchant environment. And it means ensuring a happy coexistence with all the other sectors and interests we touch. Fishing, shipping, the military, and of course, our natural environment. The Global Wind Summit is where all these issues and all our industry come together. 35,000 people from all over the world sharing insights and experience, doing business, charting the future for our industry. Above all, making sure our industry 
provides the clean, reliable and affordable energy that people want. Breaking new ground, leading the way towards a better future for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the EU Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy, Miguel Arias Cañete. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, dear ministers, dear Fati, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you here in Hamburg for what I consider one of the most important events in the renewable energy calendar of the year. Hamburg is a good place for your event, not only because Germany continues to be the biggest market for wind, but also because it is firmly anchored in the North Sea region, which we consider to be the test bed for regional cooperation on renewables. And the presence of the ministers of Norway and Denmark underline the relevance of this idea. The timing of uh, this year's event is particularly interesting as we look to finalize new rules on the European Union regulatory framework for energy policy and set the long-term perspective for a low-carbon and climate-neutral economy in Europe. Your sector, the wind industry, is without a doubt one of the main pillars of the clean energy transition today. In recent years, as costs have come down, we have seen renewable generation capacity grow steadily by 8 or 9 percent every year. Wind power is making an impressive contribution to this growth. The installed wind capacity grew by 14.8 gigawatts in 2017, bringing the European Union installed capacity up to 169 gigawatts by the end of 2017. And this has turned the industry into an important source of jobs and growth. We estimate that the renewable sector represented more than 1.4 million jobs in the European Union in 2016, and that more than 3,000 of these were in the wind sector, and this continues to rise. In my speech today, I would like to cover three main issues relating to the future of the renewable sector and the wind in particular. Firstly, the state of play as regards the clean energy for all Europeans package. Secondly, how do we ensure an investment framework that supports the energy transition, and thirdly, how we intend to show the direction in the longer term through our long-term strategy. So let me start with an update on the Clean Energy for All Europeans package which we proposed in November 2016. This package aims at adapting our regulatory framework to enable Europe to lead the clean energy transition and to deliver on our Paris Agreement's commitment, sustaining our ambition of being awarded the four renewables is closely linked to that. I am therefore very satisfied that just before the summer break, we managed to get a political agreement on our proposals on renewables, energy efficiency and governance, which in my view lives up to this ambition. Allow me to draw your attention to a number of key points in the new rules that we have negotiated. For renewables, we agree with the Parliament and Council on a binding overall target of at least 32 per cent at the European Union level for 2030. To put this into perspective for the power market, we expect that this will result in around 55 per cent of electricity from renewables by 2030. This highlights that renewable technologies will be the major players in the years ahead. However, the revised rules aims to seize the potential for renewables also in other sectors, such as transport and heating and cooling. But the revised renewables directive is much more than just a target. It contains a comprehensive set of measures across sectors in order to facilitate the deployment of renewable energy in a cost-effective way in the European Union. Our objective is to further Europe, Europeanize renewable energy policy, including by clarifying conditions for support and encouraging cross-border renewable projects. I will revert to this point in a few minutes. Administrative procedures have been simplified. We have made important steps for consumer empowerment by fixing for the first time at European Union level a clear and stable regulatory framework on cell consumption. This will allow cell consumers individually or as part of a renewable energy community to fully participate in the market without being subject to disproportionate changes or procedures. There is also a clear requirement to remove regulatory barriers 
to long-term renewable power purchase agreements and to facilitate their uptake. The ambition to see Europe as a world leader for renewables is also sustained through our new governance regulation, which will serve as the architecture of ordinary union and the mechanism for achieving the Union's 2030 objectives with Member States being required to outline a national strategy and submit national plans on how to achieve these targets. And in order to ensure that these plans reflect not just a national perspective, but also a more strategic view, the Commission will be able to recommend adjustments to these national plans in order to maximize consistency and coordination across the European Union. Our revised energy efficiency legislation also contains provisions aiming at further encouraging deployment of renewables, especially in the building sector, which has a very significant potential for decarbonization. And last but not least, the market design legislation. Achieving the clean energy transition will require important transformation of the energy system characterized by more variable renewable energies, greater decentralization and digitalization. The new electricity market design proposals will enable these developments and encourage the deployment of renewables. Indeed, it will be, make the market fit for the growing share of renewable energy by providing greater flexibility of the power system and appropriate price signals. Needless to say that the higher level of ambition that we have just agreed for renewables will make it all the more urgent to come to a rapid and ambitious agreement on modernized market rules. And I remain optimistic that we can reach a political agreement on these files by the end of the year under the Austrian presidency. At the same time, we will only be able to reach the more ambitious targets agreed upon if we can attract the necessary investment, and most of it will have to come from the private sector. Let me therefore turn to the second issue I wanted to cover today, which is what we are doing to promote investment more directly. First, the Renewables Directive includes various elements which, taken together, should ensure a more stable development of the investment framework for renewables than we have seen in the past. In addition to the ambitious targets of at least 32 per cent itself, this concerns foremost the clear rules on support schemes. While being based on market mechanisms to avoid overcompensation, we have enshrined the key principle in legislation that support should be predictable and stable with no retroactive changes. This draws the lessons of the past and sometimes painful experience with ill-designed support schemes and support scheme changes and ensures that these are not repeat. I would say that also with regard to support schemes, our learning curve has been steep. With the same objective to increase predictability, we have introduced an obligation for Member States to publish and regularly update long-term schedules for auctions, including eligible technologies. And these long-term schedules brings me to another key element of the, for the 2030 framework, the national energy and climate plans under the governance. We want them to be specific and provide the necessary background for the industry to invest in new capacity. But they could also include plans for renewable assets that reach the end of life before 2030. As a very important element, we have also requested that these national plans will be part of a public consultation with key stakeholders such as yourselves. We need to see in the plans, policies and measures to achieve the national contribution to the binding European Union level 2030 targets for renewable energy and the related trajectories as well as measures for financial support. But it's not only through regulation that we seek to facilitate the necessary investment. We are also determined to support the energy transition more strongly through our own spending in the future. Our proposal for the next multi-annual financial framework, the new seven-year European Union budget, underlines that ambition. Horizontally, we have proposed to increase the climate mainstreaming target from 20 per cent in the current period to 25 in the next. That means that over the entire budget, one in four euros is to be spent on climate change adaptation and mitigation, at the heart of which lies the clean energy transition. In absolute terms, Cohesion funding is likely to be the biggest contributor. Low-carbon investments are kept as a priority for Member States, with a higher ring fencing of 30 per cent. Crucially, there is to be a strong link between future spending and the clean energy package. Funding will be conditional on Member States meeting certain conditions, including that they do not fall below their 2020 renewable targets throughout the programming period. Of particular relevance to your industry, as the successor to the European Fund for strategic investments, the new InvestEU fund will weave 
11.5 billion euros into a sustainable infrastructure window to unlock private investments through financial instruments and tailor-made products. We can expect the wind sector to continue to be an important beneficiary of this. I will not go through all the other programs supporting the clean energy transition for lack of time, but just want to touch briefly upon the future connecting Europe facility in the energy sector. Here, our goal is to focus our means, which we have proposed to double compared to the current MFF, even more on enabling the clean energy transition. On the one hand, by completing an electricity grid that can cope with 55% or more of renewables in 2030. And on the other hand, by opening up the possibility to support directly cooperation in renewables deployment between member states at regional level with up to 186 million euros. And as proposed, this new instrument will provide technical assistance, grants for studies and grants for works for projects that are part of a member state cooperation mechanism. All of this cannot replace private investment, but can help to stimulate it. And we therefore hope for a rapid progress in the negotiations with co-legislators to finalize these files. And this brings me to my third and final point. Ultimately, the best reserve for a positive investment climate is a long-term visibility and clarity on the direction we are taking. This is the purpose of the long-term strategy that we are currently working on. Both the European Council and the European Parliament ask the Commission to develop this strategy. A public consultation is currently ongoing until the 9th of October, and I would invite all of you who haven't done so yet to contribute. We are determined to put our strategy forward in November this year ahead of COP24 in Katowice. The strategy will take a holistic look at the transitions necessary in key sectors of the economy with the energy system, which is responsible for around 75% of greenhouse gas emissions, playing a central role. It will look at power, buildings, transport, industry and agricultural sectors, including possibilities of sectorial integration to increase the overall efficiency. It will also provide useful insights for industries on technology and research and innovation needs on economic and social aspects, security of supply issues or communities for health. The long-term strategy has to be consistent with the Paris Agreement. This implies developing emission reduction scenarios, limiting global average temperatures rise to well below 2 degrees centigrade, but also exploring scenarios aiming at limiting warming to 1.5. Such objectives imply emission reductions in 2050 for the European Union ranging from minus 80% to minus 100%. The objective will not be to select a preferred scenario, but rather to look at common trends and challenges. And clearly, electrification is such a common trend and will play a fundamental role in decarbonization. All projections show that the share of electricity from renewable energy will increase further in the scenarios leading to carbon neutrality in 2050. The share of electricity in the European Union energy demand could go up to 27% in 2030 and close to 50% in 2050. And of this, at least 80% will come from renewable sources. Other solutions than electricity will be needed in sectors such as freight transport or for certain industrial processes. But it is entirely clear that a fully decarbonized, large renewables-based power system will be fundamental also for our decarbonization efforts in a long-term 2050 perspective. And this brings me back to the beginning and the importance of this conference. I see this importance not only in the dialogue between the wind industry and politics, but at least as importantly, this dialogue needs to include civil society at large. The energy transition will bring about a deep transformation of our economic model with societal impacts beyond the purely economics. This is why it needs to be inclusive and why we need to invest time and effort into continued broad public support. In this regard, the wind industry has valuable experience to share be it with models that allow citizens to share in the benefits of new developments, or be it in finding ways how to reconcile sometimes competing but ultimately reconcilable objectives such as renewable energy, development and nature protection. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in this sense that we choose the programmatic title Clean Energy for All Europeans for our policy proposals. I believe that this conference will contribute to making this happen. Thank you.
Commissioner, thank you. Well done, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome up onto the stage the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, Dr. Fatih Birol. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, dear ministers, director generals, uh, dear colleagues, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, congratulations to uh, Jais. Where is Jais? He went out. Okay, please tell him. I congratulate him because he did, in a very short period of time, a lot of good work with Wind Europe. I'm sure many of you who follow the work of uh, this very organization would agree with me, both in terms of the substance and organizational terms, he had a big, big, big contribution uh, here. It is great to be in Germany and in Hamburg, uh, in Germany, because we couldn't find a better place in, uh, than Germany discussing the wind energy and it is role in the clean energy transition. As we all know, ladies and gentlemen, Germany is one of the pioneers of the clean energy push, both in terms of renewables, but also a topic that we will not talk today, but very important in terms of energy efficiency. And to be in Hamburg is excellent. This is my second time to be in Hamburg in my life. And the first time I came here was for a more serious issue than wind. It was about to, to watch a football match with the Hamburgers SV. This is the, and then, then we lost in that match. Uh, so this is the, but I learned in that time that there is another team here called St. Pauli, which is a very uh, friendly team to Hamburger SV uh, there. So it is great uh, football city, uh, Hamburg, and it's great to be uh, here today. Now, uh, Thorsten Herden told us he would expect to hear some positive messages. I couldn't agree more. But before, and I have some facts, very important facts, that would, I would believe encourage us to think more positively. But before those facts, I would like to start with a, in my view, a scary fact. A scary fact which would highlight the importance of the positive messages. What is that one? It is the following. The main issue, emissions. Mr. Commissioner gave an excellent speech and he highlighted the importance of well below two degrees, 1.5 degrees. And to do that, what we need to see is the global emissions need to decline. We want to see the decline, the peak around 2020. But when we look at the numbers, to be honest with you, we look at the numbers every year. Every year, global emissions increased until 14, 15, 16, global emissions were flat. We were very happy. At least they are flat. Leave aside because we want to see a decline, but at least they were flat. 14, 15, 16 global emissions. But 17, they increased again. Now the bad news. It's not the very bad news now. The bad news is coming. Before I came here, and we hope that 17 is hopefully a year that will be again, we will see a decline or a flattening. Before I came here, I look at the data of the first eight months of this year. Okay? And uh, some of you know that, uh, as Jais uh, mentioned, I make my hands dirty with uh, data. And I can tell you that it would be a major positive surprise if we don't see another increase of global CO2 emissions in 2018. They will increase again. If there is no, and I, I'm happy to go on the record here, it will be a major surprise if we don't see another increase in the year 2018 after 2017. So this increase, 1718, compares with our ambitions to go below two degrees, reaching the Paris targets. I want to first put this issue in order to highlight the, the importance of the wind and other uh, important uh, technologies. 
Another, before going to wind, another important message I wanted to give it to you is about electricity. Ladies and gentlemen, global electricity consumption grows very fast. Two times in the last five years, global electricity consumption increased two times higher than global energy consumption. Very strong, mainly driven by China and uh, India. And this would give a very strong signal to governments, but also to industry. At the IEA, we look every year the investments in the energy industry, oil, gas, coal, and all of them. And decades and decades, investments going to oil and gas was number one. Decades and decades. Total, of the total energy investment, oil and gas investment got the highest share. Never changed. But 16 and 17, two years in a row, for the first time, maybe a century, global electricity investments are now higher than the oil and gas investments, both for power generation and for the networks. This is very important, and uh, you may have seen that many oil and gas companies now enlarging their portfolio and putting electricity as a, a, a part of it. So electricity is growing very strongly, and it is the reason that our World Energy Outlook 2018, as uh, uh, just mentioned, the Bible this year takes electricity as a focus, the growth drivers and the implications and the challenges for the grid for governments and others. Now, we see solar making a huge growth in the year 2017. And we expect also strong growth uh, this year. But the wind capacity growth increased but slowed down second year. And in both cases, China was number one. One issue that I want to bring to your attention before going to a wind. Our problem is the solve the, at least one of our problems, solve the climate issue. And here, the one ton of CO2 going to atmosphere from power sector or from the industry or from the transportation has the same problem, has the same challenge for all of us. One ton of CO2 going to power gen is not more valuable than the going to other one from the other one. So therefore, the issue that, or the current political move, or the sentiment, is in our view, focusing only and only, or mainly I should say, on the power sector. There are two other very important sectors we need to decarbonization efforts. One of them is heat, industry heat and home uh, heat, and the other one is transportation that we shouldn't uh, uh, forget. And we believe we see decline in the cost of renewables everywhere, solar, wind, and so on. I will come in a moment. But still, government policies remain critical. Please do not, do not think that the, we can leave everything to the markets now, hence the great efforts coming from Brussels under the great leadership of uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. This would make the industry's life much more easier or let's say much less difficult. So therefore, we need the governments here in the case of uh, Europe, of course, the national governments, but the commission to be uh, on top of the things and to enable the investments. Now, I mentioned to you that the electricity demand is growing across the world. But let's put the things in order in the context. Again, we have to look, there are many companies here focusing on Europe, but lots of business outside of Europe as well. Now, if we look at the capacity growth in different parts of the world, Europe is growing, other countries are growing, but India, for example, we, we discussed the current successful move in Brussels, increasing the share of the targets of renewables, it is very good. But we talk about the current capacity of Europe. And India, ladies and gentlemen, in 20 years is adding one entire Europe. 
not only renewables, but gas, coal, nuclear. India is adding one Europe. Second, China. We discuss a lot about the U.S. Clean Air Act goes this way or that way, share of renewables, this and that. But China, in the next 20 years, adding one United States. So therefore, decisions that will be taken in Beijing or New Delhi will be critical in terms of which power sectors, which technologies will see a decline in the cost, role of these countries in the future power mix, power technologies. And I can tell you that the, the main driver of the strong electricity demand growth in the emerging world is very simple. IEA has highlighted one month ago, air conditioners. Air conditioners is the number one electricity demand driver in India, China, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere. Therefore, coming to again the energy efficiency, the efficiency of the air conditioners in those countries will be extremely important for the uh, power sector. But again, the growth is coming from uh, those countries. Now, coming back to Europe. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, we believe you cannot look at the renewables. You cannot understand the renewables trend only looking at the renewables. You have to look at the entire market to understand the trends. Now, we look at, of course, the entire the European trends. First of all, coal. We see a significant decline in the coal share for two reasons. One, the retirements, the average age of coal plants in Europe is today 42 years old. They are close to retirements. Plus, some of the countries are pushing uh, early retirements and phase out uh, uh, policies. In terms of uh, the nuclear power, again, a significant drop as a result of retirements, plus the, uh, the phase out policies in several countries, including uh, Germany. In terms of uh, natural gas, which could provide the flexibility, as uh, Mr. Harden uh, uh, mentioned, but after 2030, with the current policies, we think the share of natural gas will slightly decline as a result of energy efficiency policies, especially for home heating, again a success story of uh, European Commission, and plus renewables are getting uh, much uh, stronger. And other renewables, mainly bioenergy. To be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, we think bioenergy is a forgotten giant, not only in Europe, why forgotten? Because numbers are big, but we don't talk a lot. I will not talk a lot now, but I can tell you the numbers of bioenergy, its contribution, modern bioenergy is very big. And it is the very reason that the IEA on 8th of October, making a renewable energy report, led by my colleague, Mr. Hemi Bahar and his team, putting an emphasis this time on bioenergy and its implications, to working with many governments around the world, European, Brazil, uh, and others. Now, we expect the solar PV will continue to uh, uh, grow and uh, it will be uh, surpassing coal around 2030. Now, the good news, the good news, in my view, the good news, I don't know if Giles is here, Giles mentioned that in the 2030, we gave a good message last year that the wind will be the, after 2030, we said, uh, wind be the number one source of electricity generation with the initiatives coming from Brussels and many governments and with the hard work of the industry in terms of cost reductions, we expect wind will be the largest source less than 10 years of time, just after 2025, and uh, will be the number one, the leading source of electricity generation in Europe. This is thanks to the hard work of the industry, but also government policies led by Brussels and uh, elsewhere. Now, 
We think that the 1,100 terawatt hours about uh, Europe would uh, produce in 2040, which is equivalent to current total electricity consumption of Japan. European wind will be producing electricity just to fit the entire uh, Japanese electricity uh, sector. And this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, of course, uh, brings uh, a lot of challenges. It's a good news, but one key issue that the IEA is taking very seriously, as some of you know, how to integrate wind and others in our systems and what are, what are the implications for the, our uh, networks. Offshore wind. Just last weekend, G7 energy ministers met in Halifax in Canada and we released the offshore wind our, uh, report. It is a rising force, we believe, ladies and gentlemen, offshore wind in the global energy landscape, and we expect a strong uh, growth, uh, first in Europe, then around the world. When we look at the recent auctions, we have a great hope to see soon to enter a period of reduction of cost in offshore uh, wind. What is behind our hope? First, the giant turbines. They are, we are able to build big turbines, economies of scale, and many companies here uh, know much better than me, size of the giant turbines is very helpful and they have the ability to tap more from the uh, wind and of course we know that the wind consistency on offshore wind is different than uh, onshore uh, wind. This, therefore, this is a very important uh, opportunity. Now, we think there is a room to go even beyond this penetration, if we see the government support, because potential is there. We need to see reduction, and if the government support comes there, we see today in the UK, in Germany, uh, in Denmark, many countries in support for that, in Netherlands uh, uh, here, and we can go uh, beyond that. And our hope is the developments in Europe can spark a wave of offshore wind appetite outside of Europe. And there are some fertile regions, grants for that. First of all, Asia, China, followed by India, there. Also North America and also uh, Latin America. There is a big uh, room uh, there. And the, of course, we are keeping a very close eye, working with the several industry leaders here what about the opportunities that the, the, the floating turbines can provide for the offshore wind developments across the world? We are working very closely uh, with them. Finally, I would like to tell you that the offshore wind, as many of you uh, uh, know, opens an excellent door for a new push for hydrogen. The G20 summit in Japan next year will be focusing on the hydrogen. And this will take it a, give a big push, I hope, and for which, for the Japan presidency, we are, as the International Energy Agency, providing a comprehensive policy recommendation for the G20 leaders. How can we go ahead with hydrogen where the offshore wind is a critical uh, element. And I would like to also congratulate the Austrian government. Dr. Lösch uh, told me the hydrogen initiative, which will be announced very soon in, in, uh, in Austria. Now, everything seems very promising, lots of opportunity, but one challenge I have to highlight uh, to you before I finish my uh, words, which is the very issue that we have to integrate 
wind and solar to our electricity systems. And this is not a peanuts issue. It requires attention, right policy design, and investments. When I go across the world, many ministers, especially in Asia, and also in Latin America, they have an appetite for domestic development of solar and wind, but the main question in their mind is, what about the electricity security? Okay, so therefore we have at the IEA developed a system integration uh, uh, unit, which is definitely helping many countries. But when we look at the countries, if the share of solar and wind in the total electricity uh, generation is less than 5%, it doesn't need a major intervention. It doesn't cost a big uh, challenge. But when it goes a bit higher, then we need to make sure that we have some flexibility uh, mechanisms, both using thermal power, for example, gas, or existing hydropower, or making the grids ready for that. But if their share comes close to 20%, now we have to make investments. Investments to create flexibilities. Power plants to support the winter and renewables. Demand side policies to play with the uh, uh, load curve. Storage, keyword uh, here. And again, grids, grids, grids. As uh, Mr. Harden mentioned, it is a very important part of the when we think solar and wind, the third word needs to come out, um, I'm, I believe, uh, is grids. What do we do with grids? If it goes beyond that, as it is the case in uh, Denmark, we will listen to the Danish minister uh, 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 very soon, or in Ireland, this requires of course, much better uh, closer focus on what kind of technologies we need and what kind of investment and specific policy designs for the operators and beyond in order to uh, ensure the reliability of the uh, uh, grip. But if I can leave you with one word here, when we talk about the system integration, for me the magic word is flexibility we have to create flexibility in our systems to address the challenge which is coming from the solar and wind penetration in addition to their several advantages they bring to the market and our uh, economies. To finish, ladies and gentlemen, we think when we look at all clean energy technologies, both onshore and offshore wind have a, still a huge potential. We are just in the, at the beginning of the story, both onshore and offshore wind, both for electricity generation and uh, beyond. When we see the numbers that we are showing and others are uh, uh, showing, the, it is extremely important, the design of our power systems to make them more uh, flexible, to prepare ourselves secure of electricity and reducing the costs. Therefore, the appropriate market design will be very important. Now, when we look at the, the renewables wave started, Germany, Denmark were the pioneers several years ago. And the numbers today, both in terms of gigawatts and in terms of the dollars in terms of cost reduction, gigawatts increased. Today, we believe we can now start the second half, the next chapter, which should be focusing on the transportation, buildings, and industrial sector, what we can do to make renewables have a higher share there. And finally, the, uh, we are, as the International Energy Agency, having uh, 37 members of our family, US, Canada, European countries, Japan, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, we are very ready to support the clean energy transitions by providing timely data, good analysis, objective and good analysis, and 
providing real-world solutions to all the governments working very closely with the energy industry. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome up onto the stage the Energy Minister of Norway, Mr. Hjell Freiberg. Ministers, friends and uh, colleagues, guten Morgen. Thank you for the invitation to Hamburg and thank you for the chance to say a few words about uh, today's topic uh, from a Norwegian perspective. Norway has a unique uh, starting point when it uh, comes to energy. We have uh, large oil and gas uh, reserves, especially gas. Most of our gas goes to Europe. Norwegian gas covers about 30% of the gas used in Germany. At the same time, we also have much renewable energy. 98% of our electricity production comes from hydropower. About 70% of our total energy used consists of renewable energy. Clean, reliable and flexible hydropower has been the backbone of our power supply for a long time. This will continue. At the same time, Norway has lots of wind power resources. We see a strong and increasing interest in wind power. Right now, many large onshore projects are being built. The development of wind power in Norway creates opportunities for suppliers and investors from both, Nor from both Norway and other countries. The government welcomes the further development of wind power in Norway. Our policy is uh, simple. In general, the development of renewable energy should be market-based. We are not planning to introduce any new subsidies for renewable energy. On the other hand, we are now identifying location on land best, best suited for wind power. Available wind resources, grid capacity, and impact on the environment and host communities will be important yardsticks. This will ensure a balance, balanced development of wind power. Another important aspect of the Norwegian power system is our relation with our neighbors. We have traded power with our Nordic neighbors for decades. Now cables to UK and Germany are also being built. We need a close cooperation with our European neighbors as we face many of the same challenges. One of these challenges is more use of renewable electricity. Because of our hydropower resources, Norway has, a, has for a long time used electricity for more purpose than other countries. It um, has been the foundation for a large power intensive industry in Norway. Even so, we are now seeking to electrify new sectors. The transport sector is K. Norway already has the highest number of electric cars per, per capita in the world. We are also moving forward with electric ships and ferries. The development will continue. We are also promoting the development of new industries, such as large power-consuming data centers. Europe is going in the same direction. I believe power trading across border is an important 
a part of the solution when our society use electrici electricity for new purposes. Please um, allow me to say a few words about offshore wind. We are preparing the opening of one or two areas in Norwegian waters of offshore renewable energy production. These areas might be relevant for large commercial projects in the future. In the line with our general policy, we are not planning to introduce, introduce new subsidies for these areas. Already, Norwegian expertise in offshore operation have been used in developing large offshore wind farms. High Wind Scotland, the first floating wind farm in the world, is a good example. Norwegian industry has brought knowledge and competence related to oil and gas, renewable energy and the maritime sector. It is interesting to see the expertise put to use in offshore wind projects. I am convinced that Norwegian firms will have a lot to offer in the offshore wind sector. Norway sees a great potential in floating offshore wind and will continue to follow the development closely. I look forward to hearing your perspective on these issues. And thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome to the stage the Energy Minister of Denmark, Lars Christian Lillehalt. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diels, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me to the conference. I would like to present a video to all of you. This video will give you the story of Danish offshore wind. I will also focus on the North Sea Energy Corporation. I'm very happy that Denmark holds the presidency of this corporation. I hope you will enjoy the video. Thank you and enjoy the conference. We call them wind turbines, but we might as well call them wind power plants. In one year, a large offshore wind turbine produces enough energy to provide electricity for approximately 10,000 households. Today, wind turbines are a flourishing industry. Global companies have taken the lead in their development and production. But the modern wind turbine was created by enthusiasts, craftsmen, scholars and small businesses in Western Denmark. The starting point was the oil crisis of 1973. Many people in the windy country of Denmark saw wind turbines as an opportunity to cut the ties to oil. This paved the way for innovation and entrepreneurship. Ever since, government, businesses and researchers have supported the development of wind energy. This has made wind energy more efficient and competitive. The first serially produced wind turbine, Rieseer Müllen, arrived in 1973. It was 20 meters tall and had a capacity of 22 kilowatts. Today we are testing offshore wind turbines with a height of 250 meters, blades as long as 100 meters, and a capacity of 10 megawatts, capable of delivering 450 times more power than the Rieseer turbine. As the price of offshore wind has tumbled down, a global market has developed. At the same time, Denmark has demonstrated that it is possible to integrate a high share of wind power in electrical production, while also maintaining world-class security of supply. Wind energy is ready to take the next big step in Denmark to replace fossil fuels and become the primary source in the renewable-based energy system. This will require projects on a scale we have yet to see, and it will require cooperation 
cooperation between countries on the deployment of turbines and the production and distribution of electricity. The world is using more and more energy. We expect world energy demand to rise by more than 30% by the year 2035. This is happening while climate change and the importance of protecting our planet is becoming ever more apparent. Therefore, it is essential for Denmark, Europe and the rest of the world to live up to the Paris Agreement and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Increasing energy demand must be met with an increase of renewable energy, including offshore wind power. Across the globe, the quest for renewable energy solutions has long since begun, and in many places, wind power has proved to be the most convincing solution. But for wind power to replace fossil fuels and become one of our most significant energy sources, costs must come down, and we must deploy more wind turbines offshore with relatively shallow waters, sites that allow for deployment of offshore wind farms far from the coastline and ideal wind conditions, the North Sea is the obvious location for large-scale offshore wind expansion. The North Sea holds the potential to become Europe's renewable energy power plant. It is expected that the North Sea has the capacity for producing up to 20% of the EU's demand for electricity by the year 2040, or up to 15 times as much wind power as is produced there today. It is Denmark's ambition that the North Sea will be a prime location for offshore wind deployment without subsidies, but this will require cooperation. That is why Denmark is deeply involved in the North Sea's energy cooperation. A cooperation that, besides Denmark, includes Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Germany, Belgium, France, the United Kingdom, and Ireland. The cooperation has a rotating presidency. From the summer of 2018 to the summer of 2019, it is Denmark's turn. The North Sea's energy cooperation aims to bring down the costs of offshore wind expansion. This can be done by coordinating further expansion and perhaps even developing joint ventures, utilizing the best sites in the North Sea, harmonizing regulation across borders, and sharing best practice on how to deploy offshore wind in a more cost-efficient manner. By developing common standards in the North Sea's energy cooperation, the wind industry would in the future no longer need to adapt production of wind turbines and foundations to different markets with different standards. One market with common standards will help ensure cheap, sustainable energy to citizens and businesses across Europe. Today, 90% of the world's offshore wind capacity is installed in Europe. However, major countries outside of Europe are developing interests in offshore wind. A global market for offshore wind is expected to grow significantly towards 2030. Denmark is cooperating with both China and the state of California on sharing Danish know-how and competencies in order to assist in the expansion of wind power. These political agreements are not only beneficial for the partners involved, but for the rest of the world and the climate. Wind power can provide cheap, sufficient and secure electricity. But more fluctuating energy requires cooperation and coordination and being able to exchange power across borders. The transition towards renewable energy will require more than the production of energy at affordable prices. It is also about creating a smart and integrated energy system, a coherent market-based system where renewable energy is used efficiently and can be delivered with a high security of supply. This requires that we electrify our energy system and integrate sectors so that there is electricity in our power outlets heating and our houses, and energy for our cars, no matter how the wind blows. A smart energy system. 
In the long term, it is expected that technologies that can convert and store renewable electricity, such as electrolysis and methanization, will allow us to make even better use of our wind energy resources. Denmark has also developed strong electricity interconnectors to its neighbors, and more are on their way. They make it possible for electricity to flow freely across borders and make the best use of our wind resources. The Rieseer turbine from the 70s has long been decommissioned but its offspring have grown to become master dons. The EU has set a target to reach 32% renewable energy by 2030. In Denmark, a new energy agreement, backed by all parties in the parliament, has set Denmark on a path towards 55% renewable energy by 2030, and being completely free of fossil fuels by 2050. The dash for wind in northwestern Europe has provided the spark for an industrialization of wind energy that has brought down costs in an unprecedented pace, and we have only just begun. The first subsidy-free wind farms in Europe are already on the drawing boards. In a few years, offshore wind will be the cheapest source of energy in Europe, only surpassed by wind on land. The North Sea's energy cooperation leads the way for Denmark and Europe to reach its goals on greenhouse gas and uphold its obligations set out in the Paris Agreement. Offshore wind is on the cusp of a major global breakthrough. Reductions in cost will soon make it possible for offshore wind to compete with other energy sources in the market. Offshore wind will not only create jobs and green growth, it will make it possible for Europe and the rest of the world to rid itself of fossil fuels and create a sustainable future for everyone on this planet. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome up onto the stage the Director General for Energy in the Austrian Government, current Presidency of the European Union, Dr. Michael Losch. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Ministers. Fatih uh, Good morning, Hamburg. I was invited uh, representing Austria as the current uh, EU presidency, but allow me some few words. Uh, for me, also the first time to be in Hamburg, uh, and it's great to be in the region uh, which represents the largest power plant for Austria. Uh, Austria has about 10 gigawatt peak uh, uh, consumption in electricity, uh, and we have uh, interconnectors to Germany, about uh, 11 gigawatt thermal capacity and uh, we import from Germany about, uh, also in the future, uh, five gigawatt uh, in, in, in winter times when we don't have enough uh, um, river hydro capacity. Uh, we need uh, this energy and we are happy if this energy doesn't come from thermal power plants but comes from wind energy produced here in Northern Europe. And uh, we are very glad that this vision is going to expand uh, and uh, that's also why we, uh, in our national politics, we very much uh, depend, uh, as a country landlocked in the middle and the heart of Europe, we depend on the internal electricity market, on a functioning electricity market, which is capable of bringing this future uh, of uh, offshore wind uh, and also onshore wind in, in the areas where there is most wind in Europe, also into the heart of Europe, into the southern areas. And therefore, it's also important, as has been said, that grids are capable of, of doing that. And we currently have still some problems uh, in the grids between Austria and inside Germany to bring this electricity further south. So that was, was an uh, ad hoc initial remark here. Um, and very, we are very grateful as presidency now uh, that the commission and our uh, prior um, preceding presidency, uh, Bulgaria, achieved uh, the, uh, the framework for the ambitious uh, renewable goals of 22, uh, 32% by uh, uh, 2030, this has been said. Uh, 
And we are fully committed to now to finalize the second important step that this uh, electricity, this renewable electricity in the coming years will be able to be integrated in the market and therefore this market integration and the regulation uh, on uh, the electricity uh, market uh, directive and on the regulation is so important that uh, uh, we can uh, accomplish that. So uh, allow me also to, to shortly say uh, there have been numbers mentioned. Um, Europe will move to this will this this 32 percent will mean 50 55 percent of uh, renewable electricity and we all believe we don't know exactly the estimations that electricity will grow electricity will not grow only in, as a percentage in the energy mix but also in absolute terms will have to grow because only uh, with electricity we will be able to via sector coupling to decarbonize sectors uh, such as transport via e-mobility and also heating via heat pumps and also in summer via air conditions which are already electric so this sector coupling idea and the importance of the electricity sector is, uh, we are well aware about that in Austria and also as a EU uh, presidency. And Austria, we, um, we, um, uh, the Austrian government was able to conclude in, in the first uh, five, six months of its, uh, of its new start uh, a comprehensive energy and climate strategy called Mission 2030. And we have set ourselves uh, a target for 2030 of uh, 45 to 50 percent renewable share and 100% of renewable electricity in the year 2030. 100% on balance. That means, of course, we will import during important times uh, a year in, in winter, and we are happy that, that import, we hope that most of the imported electricity will also be renewable, as I said before. Uh, and of course, there will be some uh, balancing uh, requirement also in, in, in intradays and uh, reserve capacity markets. But the overall aim is that we have a 100% market based on renewables. So the big challenge is now, to my view, to tackle this volatility. We will have 100% renewables, and except for biomass and biogas, which is also a, uh, a key pillar, but for also hydroelectric uh, plants, uh, they are more and more uh, uh, becoming intermittent, even river plants. Uh, in uh, winter time, the Danube River is uh, only a small fraction of uh, what it delivers in, in, in spring and summer. Uh, and of course, wind and solar will be even more intermittent or volatile, as it said. And I, uh, brought as a, brought as a chart, a European chart, uh, if you just see the, the load, so the demand, and you see a typical uh, a winter and the summer uh, pattern of, uh, of a week. A winter week, you see in, in uh, blue, is still all over uh, Europe all over, uh, about 80 terawatt higher, more demand uh, as in summer. So the the blue line being above about uh, 80 to 100 terawatt above the red line. And we also see pretty much the same pattern. We even see maybe in summer there was a holiday on Monday because there was not such a peak on the Monday. Um, but we see also the day and night volatility or variability, which is about 140 terawatt. So system integrations, we have on the one hand side the intermittent production and we have this variable demand with this Topic, I would say, a day-night volatility of about 140 terawatt and a seasonal plus a seasonal volatility of about 80 terawatt. And we need different solutions and we need all kinds of technologies uh, to tackle that. And um, we see basically as a presidency, we set two uh, important pillars of our policy. One pillar will be technology and innovation to provide the technologies to do that, smart technologies and uh, uh, hydrogen storage. I will come to that in, a, in another minute. And secondly, regulation, a, a good functioning market, which has to be able to uh, accomplish that. So to put it, be a little bit more precise, what do we see as challenge uh, to integrate or solutions to integrate and to tackle this, integrate renewables and to tackle these problems? First of all, we have the big debate. This is a regulatory issue. This, is, this will be the biggest debate we expect uh, in, in the next weeks uh, for finalizing the electricity market regulation. The question of reserve capacity and capacity mechanisms all over Europe. We see that more and more uh, incumbent electricity producers, thermal electricity producers based on coal, uh, also on gas, 
they see that they having more and more amortization problem because wind and solar is taking away more and more for their over more of a long and longer periods uh, of the year taking away uh, markets and they are calling uh, for different mechanisms and throughout Europe uh, we have now a kind of competition uh, of, of capacity mechanisms and we have to be very very careful and we are happy that this is a key issue tackled by the electricity regulation uh, because we need to give a, a clear framework we have, to be, we have to ensure that in Europe we do not only regulate and frame the renewable support with state aid rules and with uh, clear rules in the, in the market. We expect from the renewables to be market ready to function with a very limited amount of subsidies and um, auctioning of uh, market premium and so on. And at the same time we have a growing sector of fossil production who is calling also for subsidies, uh, state aid, in the form of capacity mechanisms. And what we is expect as Austria is that uh, at least as a, the, the, the money, the subsidies given to uh, renewables are still at the forefront and are not overtaken by money given to under the terms of capacity mechanisms uh, to the, uh, to the uh, old, I would say, fossil uh, plants. And we have to be very careful that also the mechanisms are strict, are stringent, are limited in time, and we are working on that, of course, as a, as a broker, as a presidency, we have to be an honest broker and we have to seek a compromise for Europe, and, uh, but not only in other countries, also at home in Austria. We have, we have, we see still a necessity over the next years to do something about that missing uh, part in times of no wind and no sun and little hydro. So uh, there is uh, indeed a problem and uh, we are very happy together with the Commission uh, that we will be able to broker a solution in this uh, respect, a very important issue. Secondly, it was mentioned, uh, Fatih Birol, uh, excellent, I, I don't want to add a lot uh, to, to, uh, to your analysis. We need, uh, and that's for me for the short-term issue, this daily volatility. I think that we can tackle it with demand-side management, smart grids, uh, and, and, and also storage, uh, um, lithium-based battery storage. Uh, we need an intelligent system uh, which can, which can uh, tackle this, uh, bridge this gap. Third point, it's also a technology point, uh, the long term, the seasonal, uh, the seasonal gap. The seasonal gap will be hard to manage with uh, demand side, it will be hard to wait five months to uh, turn on your fridge or it will be hard to, uh, to build so many lithium uh, iron batteries to store something for, uh, for half a year. <clears throat> so we think that the new idea is here hydrogen, that the conversion of electricity into hydrogen uh, and the addition of this hydrogen then feed in of hydrogen into our gas grids, thereby making our gas greener, could be the future and could be uh, uh, a very promising technology to tackle this seasonal uh, gap and to bring in more and more uh, um, hydro, um, wind uh, produced uh, electricity and solar produced uh, electricity into our grid. And a fourth, again, regulatory challenge is connected to the internal market. We think that uh, we need to, uh, to exploit the best areas in Europe for a, a renewable production. And again, I can just underline, and I'm very happy with the Danish examples, we are very happy if these areas in Northern Europe uh, are exploited uh, offshore. This is the most cost-effective wind uh, production, you know, renewable production nowadays. And please allow also Southern and Central Europe to share uh, in this market. Uh, and uh, I think a good example is in the Commission is in the Governance Directive, which was already um, uh, adopted uh, under our Bulgarian uh, uh, friends, that there are <coughs> mechanisms, for example, this renewable financing platform, which should allow for really European projects. And they can be in the north offshore wind, and they can be in the south of Europe and in the north of Africa, uh, kind of uh, desert uh, photovoltaic projects. We think that uh, this would allow really from the periphery of Europe uh, also to, to exploit uh, photovoltaic and, and wind for all Europeans. So a big challenge and a big responsibility also for the uh, Commission uh, in the next uh, months and, and years to, uh, to set the right framework for these financing mechanisms also in context with the EIB uh, and the FC, the, the Juncker package uh, and also an Austrian Mr. Mr. Molter are now heading the, uh, the Juncker uh, part. This is important for the overall uh, picture. And let me 
finalize uh, the thing is our hydrogen initiative. It doesn't work anymore. Um, last week, there was the Energy Council. Uh, doesn't work. And we were very happy that our uh, idea, and Fatih Birol mentioned it, our idea to bring in hydrogen, uh, uh, we formulated the hydrogen declaration. 25 member states, and including also the commission, supported it, signed it, surplus in Linz. Linz is the biggest uh, electricity consumer where the steel uh, industry is in Austria. Uh, the idea is indeed to bring in hydrogen uh, not only as a storage, not only into electromobility, uh, not only um, uh, in uh, conversion uh, in these areas, but also to inject hydrogen directly into the gas grid without further transformation. And a 5 10% uh, mix of hydrogen in the uh, gas grid should not be a problem. And in addition, it can also take with, uh, uh, with the hydrogen uh, the biogas with it to make our gas grid greener and to tackle the long-term storage problem. So regulatory issues and technological issues which can solve these uh, problems on this way to this ambitious, uh, ambitious target. And I hope you here and in your discussions uh, in Hamburg uh, will contribute uh, to, uh, to, this important, uh, uh, to this important target for whole of Europe. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome the Director General of Business here, Markus Beider. So good morning, Commissioner, uh, Executive Director, Ministers, uh, Director Generals, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Well, first let me thank Charles for having me, inviting me here, and uh, let me congratulate you, Charles. I, I totally agree with Fatih Birol. I think you did a great job in Wind Europe, and uh, this conference is really impressive. I think I don't need to say much about Business Europe. We consider ourselves the main advocate of growth and competitiveness in Europe. And I would like to use these 10 minutes I've been given uh, to focus on two points. Number one, uh, on energy transition, obviously, and uh, on what it means for different highly exposed actors in this transition. And number two, uh, Charles has asked me to talk a little bit about the bigger picture, where are we a uh, bigger picture on global terms, I mean, where are we on global competition, and what is the factors uh, driving European industry at the time being. So to start with energy, obviously. Well, um, I've witnessed in the five and a half years, I'm now uh, the Director General of Business Europe, and also in the years before when I, when I served on its board as members, quite a number of heated debates on this energy transition, within Business Europe, Charles knows some of these debates. And of course, many things have been uh, frankly uh, discussed uh, on how to position Europe uh, towards its main competitors, on how to get this transition right, on how to deal with the ETS uh, and other points. But I think I've also witnessed, and specifically over the last years, evolution in the positions, clear evolutions in the direction of I would say it's very clear that the European business community, European industry, has meanwhile driven by market realities, technological changes, also public perception, has very much embraced the need of transition to low carbon economy. And I think I can clearly say that European industry sees itself as part uh, of the solution. Does this mean that there is not a number of challenges we still need to address in this debate? Of course not. Does it mean I will not one or the other time have to write a letter of concern to my very esteemed uh, friend, Commissioner Arias Cañete, on one or the other issues? Well, I'm afraid not. But I can assure you, and I'm pretty sure that what we are saying and what we are doing uh, is more than ever constructive and solution-oriented. So some of you, or many of you, and uh, Charles has raised this with me, have certainly read in one or the other newspapers in the last days uh, that Business Europe is allegedly torpedoing or sabotaging uh, European uh, climate goals targets for 2030. Well, I must say, this is a very ma well made up story. 
uh, from a craftsmanship side. But at the same time, it's simply not true, or uh, not at all true. So I appreciate the opportunity of this conference today to tell you about our real position after debate and the real position we have found as a compromise is, and I think this is important. So number one, there's a strong support by the European business community on the ambition and on climate action. I mean, this is very clear. We are very committed to the targets. We have always been committed to the targets. I've been one of the first ones after Marrakesh when the US pulled out to say, we stay with our targets and we are committed to the targets. So this is number one. Of course, we'll continue to say we will not be able to solve the problem on our own. Of course, we'll continue to say we need to bring the others to be more ambitious, because otherwise, with a share of 5% we will have in 2030, we'll not solve the issue alone. But, and this is very clear, we are committed to the targets. Second, of course, we stand ready to provide solutions, and I've been talking about this. Third, and this is important, of course, we consider the 40% target as an ambitious target. And we think there's a solid set of uh, policies in place now to implement it. And our main focus would lie on implementation and execution. And fourth, and I think this is a bit also what the Commissioner meant when he spoke about these issues in summer, if these policies help us to go beyond the 40% target, this is very welcome. And we think this is a very strong signal uh, to the international community. So this is our position. And I think it's quite a balanced and, uh, and, uh, and, and balanced one. But of course, the story, because this is 2030, the story does not end in 2030. We know that we will need to be more ambitious going beyond 2030. Uh, and we are working on a new energy and climate vision in order to be tackling this goal and in order to be ready to discuss with the next institutions, with the incoming institutions after the EU elections, and to have our position there. And we do this in close coordination with many sectors, including your sector. So wind, uh, of course, is part of, this, of these discussions and a point of view we very much uh, take uh, into account. And I think it's a very good example, because you've, meet, you've, you've moved, and, and we've heard it in speech of Fatih Behol, from a niche provider to a mainstream energy source, and very important for us, also to a more and more cost competitive ones. And uh, having listened to Charles, I mean, I can very much embrace this clean, reliable, and affordable. So, but what does it mean now for different groups? Of course, first there's the energy providers, you and others. And there's many challenges. Phasing out coal, decentralized energy production, infrastructure needs, public accept acceptance, and so on and so on. And I see one key response to all these questions, and this is more Europe. We need to do more together. We need to coordinate better. We need to go on and deepen the energy union. Uh, and we need stronger progress in cross-border connections. And, uh, uh, the Commissioner has talked about the Connecting Europe facility. This is key. We need to integrate our electricity markets. We need to manage energy flows. And of course, we see that the negotiations are difficult on electricity market design package, on capacity mechanisms, on transmission system operators. All this is different debates. But, but the aim is, of course, to make our common electricity market more competitive. And in order to do so, we also need to progressively phase out discriminatory practices. We need a level playing field. We need to allow for businesses to create their own stories of success. And I think your sector is very much part of this. And we have seen in the figures that onshore wind industry, meanwhile, can compete on equal footing with other sources. And offshore is well on track. So this shows that this is possible. Second group I wanted to talk about is uh, technology providers. And clearly, I mean, here, of course, this is mainly about opportunities, and your group is also part of it. And European companies are pioneering. I think here the challenges are rather coming from the outside, from more forceful global competition, and this is important to tackle. At the same time, we think that regulators, lawmakers, legislators need to be vigilant to pick 
winners and losers too early. We think we need market forces to, to act here, and we need a sound legislative framework providing for a certain stability to have its right. Third, of course, I also need to talk about energy-intensive industries. Your clients, at the same time also your suppliers of chemicals, steel, concrete, and others. As you, this sector is deeply engaged in the transition, and you know that uh, between 1990 and 2015, there was a reduction of minus 36 percent, and it's embracing a low-carbon economy. At the same time, of course, there are still a number of issues to be fixed. Of course, one of the answers is very much electrification. But looking at the situation for the time being, by no means we can be sure that there will be sufficient reliable, competitively priced, especially low-carbon electricity available. But I think it's very important, and uh, we had a little look at your study, and we will have to look deep in the figures that you talk about uh, what is possible in electrification, because this will be key. Of course, there's other things we need to tackle. For instance, uh, taxes. The time being, they account for 43 percent of electricity prices, and this is a problem. We also think we should allow uh, industries to sign long-term electricity contracts. This is something where we have significant differences, competitive differences with other parts of the world, and we think this is uh, very important. And last but not least, obviously, we also continue to think that, of course, as long as we don't have a level global playing field, we need to continue to protect certain sectors against unfair global competition. Let me come to the other point I wanted to talk about, to the global outlook, and I'll try to be brief on this, even so you should talk an hour about this or more. The global picture, of course, is a challenging one. I mean, we are still number one in uh, trade and manufactured goods. Uh, globally, we have a global share of 33 percent overall. At the same time, the truth is, in the last 10 years, we lost 10, 7 percentage points. So, uh, so this is a challenge. There are several reasons for this. There is high cost of doing business in Europe. There is risk adversity, so which sometimes hinders us from being innovative. There is aggressive strategies from competitors, like made in China, made in India, or America first. In addition to this, of course, the picture becomes more blurry because we're living a disruption of world trade order. Looks a bit better recently. We, as a business community, have been very active in working for a more positive transatlantic agenda again, together with our friends in the U.S. Chamber and the National Association of Manufacturers. We're still on thin ice, but it looks better than before the summer. Also very much thanks to the effort of the President of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. Of course, when we have a trade war between the U.S. and China, I mean, we are affected. It is European companies who are in the front row in China. It's European companies who are in the front row in the U.S. And therefore, this is something we also need uh, to deal with. But there's also opportunities. I mean, the recent behavior of uh, the U.S. administration is, of course, opening up opportunities. We have rapidly concluded, more rapidly than foreseen, the Japan agreement. The Canada agreement is done. There's another, a number of other opportunities. And if things go right, we could be in the center of the most powerful trading network the world has ever seen in some years. But we are not there yet. The time being, we are a bit trapped between two tendencies. One, the rise of protectionism on the one side. The other one, the others, mainly in Europe, who want to overburden trade with all kinds of things, labor, environment, and so on. Of course, trade can, can be used as a carrier ship to improve these things, but we must not overburden it. So to come to an end, I think it's very important that we not only remain, but will more than before uh, very much fight for an improved world order, and I think Europe has the potential and will have to be one of the key drivers, because this is our markets, and otherwise we will not succeed. But we also have to do our homework. As we see it, of course, a strong and modern EU industrial strategy is very important, is key. One built upon our own strength, European strengths. And I'm pretty much convinced that your sector, wind energy, is one of these strengths we need to build upon.
Thank you. Very good indeed. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now for the closing part of our opening session, please welcome up onto the stage the three global event ambassadors. Hans-Dieter Kertwig, Managing Director of Enercon, Anja Dertzenrat, the CEO of E.ON Climate and Renewables, and Philippe Cavafian, the CEO of MHI Vestas. Anya, can I fire the first question at you? We've heard a lot about electrification this morning. Uh, what is E.ON doing to make electrification happen? Well, I think we are absolutely committed to, uh, uh, to foster the transition towards an uh, um, electric uh, future of Europe. And um, I think we heard a lot of um, very inspiring thoughts about that today. Um, and I would like also to link to the recent study, which I think will be published today. Mm -hmm. um, Exactly, and uh, it's, it's, it's worth really a read. It's very, very interesting, and uh, I think it puts uh, things a little bit into perspective. I think uh, um, reality is we are at 24% electrification today, but in order to meet um, the... Um, let's say, our commitments. Um, uh, we, we kind of all signed up to in Paris. I think we need to go up to 62%. Um, and if you look at it sector by sector, I think the, the picture is a little mixed, I would say. I think the power sector did quite a good job since uh, 1990, um, reducing emissions by roughly 500 million tons, the equivalent of roughly 28%. Same um, percentage in the heating sector, uh, 28%, an equivalent of 200 million uh, tons CO2. Uh, CO2. Um, transport, um, unfortunately, um, uh, the other way around, increased CO2 emissions by 13%. Um, another uh, 200 million of CO2. So I think the, the starting points uh, are, let's say, a little bit different. And I think uh, I, I would like to stress again the importance of sector coupling in order to meet the tariff at the Paris um, objectives, um, sector coupling is absolutely vital. Um, it provides a fantastic opportunity, clearly, for the wind uh, industry. We heard from Fatih today that wind will be the winning technology in the long run. So in order to electrify the sector, I think uh, companies like, like us here on the stage um, will, um, will, let's say, have to play a very important role, um, the OMs, but also clearly uh, um, companies like ourselves uh, being a very committed investor in the field. Um, but clearly, the upstream, tackling upstream is not good enough. Um, we heard today that grids will play, it's grids, 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 um, as we heard, uh, will play a vital role. We need to foster investments into the grid, in power grids, but also uh, district heating, gas. Um, we heard the importance of uh, um, hydrogen, etc. Um, and finally, the demand sector, um, so to say, the, the customer side of things, demand side management will play a very important role. Clearly, being active in all three sectors as a company, um, I think we, we understand our obligation to make, uh, to make Paris work, and we are tackling uh, basically, let's say, all three elements as we speak. That's great. Philippe, turbine size has been a key driver in reducing costs, especially in offshore wind. Where are you going with this in MHI Vestas? Actually, we kept a surprise for you today because, uh, you know, Europe is on top of the technology and the experience for offshore wind and uh, our plan is to stay on top and uh, therefore we decided to simplify the life of our customers and uh, dividing by 9.5 or 8.8 .8 is a very complicated math. So we decided to put the first 10 megawatt turbine offshore in the waters of Europe and we'll be the first company to do this. So, to, to be just precise, our V164 platform has been growing uh, over the last two years from 8 uh, all the way to 9.5 megawatt, but uh, it's growing further, and, and therefore the life will be very simple. You just divide by 10 megawatt when mm -hmm. you want to build offshore wind farms. Um, but uh, to be a little bit more uh, to the point of your question, the, the size of the turbine matters, but for offshore what matters is the innovation 
all across the value chain. And this is the main reason the cost of offshore wind have been going down. It's basically the innovation in the foundation. Uh, we had the first uh, suction bucket jacket installed in less than three hours in Aberdeen. Uh, we are going to have next year in Germany the first monopile suction packet. So this is uh, innovation to reduce the installation time. There's the cabling technology that is also improving. We go 66 kV to reduce the, the loss of efficiency in the, in the wind farm. All these technologies are key in addition to what we consider the turbine technology. Same for onshore and offshore better aero design, better material science. This is driving uh, more output for, I would say, larger machine, but not necessarily heavier machine. And so we increase the revenue, we reduce the cost. That's mm -hmm. the secret. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Philippe, and for your announcement. Hans Dieter, over the next five years, 80% of all of the new wind turbines installed in Europe will still be onshore. Yes, in total, Europe will be installing, we think, 17 gigawatts of new wind on average each year over the next five years. But in certain countries, there are some very worrying signals in the market. What impact are these signals having on the manufacturers of wind turbines? Yeah, first of all, I must uh, say I'm very impressed from the speech of Mr. Canetti and from Mr. Briol about the future and we see the big, big targets, and also the targets for the next five years in Europe to install 14 gigawatt year by year. But if we see today what has happened, then we must uh, a little bit make a reset. And for us, from a wind energy uh, turbine manufacturer, it's very important that, especially for Germany, we, learn, we must learn from mistakes in the last three, four years. The onshore market, uh, installed a lot of turbines, more than 15,000 megawatt in the last four years in Germany. Plus offshore, we, we did a lot of work. And we see for the next two, three years in Germany, in the last two years, we killed jobs. We are not completely clear in our political uh, uh, guidelines for the future. We uh, think in, we saw in Germany that we go from, um, from a system of feed-in tariff to an uh, auction system. And we did it, now we must accept it, but we did it for us, for, for Enercon and from, from our competitors, we um, did it a little bit too quick, a little bit uh, not see the whole picture. Sometimes you must see, okay, it is, it is a wish from the politicians to make it very uh, quick, but be from, uh, be, we, um, from BWE and our um, consultants and so on, we, we make not more passion to, to the politicians to understand the whole market. And what we see in the next two, three years is the onshore market is dropped down from 5,000 megawatt to 1,500 in next year, 2,000 in next year. So that means that the, the target is very high and the chances, Mr. Briol, uh, shows us a very good picture. But if you see now India or, or the other uh, countries, if they are looking to Germany, this High industrial countries started uh, with the Energiewende, and the, the last two years killed a lot of things what we have in our mind because we lose jobs at this moment and we lose also the know how for the future. And um, the targets for offshore, believe me, it's fantastic, but uh, every um, Offshore and onshore, what I learned in the last days is also we did in the past a mistake. Uh, we did a fight between the utilities, old ones, and the new utilities sinking. And uh, the same is the mistake offshore against onshore. I think we must bring a completely uh, sinking together, and then it works with the big targets. But what, what we feel is as a manufacturer is if we not have a clear signal from the politicians, then we cannot make an industrial planning. We, we cannot create jobs for the future. And now we are fighting as Enercon and with our competitors in Germany that we create new jobs for the next decade. And so that would, is, would be very helpful. It's come a completely clear signal from Brussels to Berlin, to London and whatever. Please, the clear signal is very important. Mm -hmm. And not this one day yes, and the over next day perhaps. 
Philippe Fatty was very clear, you can't leave this to the market. Governments need to apply policies to keep investments going. What sort of policies? Indeed, we, we, we don't believe the market will uh, fix it by itself. The, there's a need for a policy. We, we are absolutely confident that the time of subsidies is not no longer the request because not only we have uh, the most powerful wind turbine or bigger and bigger wind turbines are reducing the, the capex, the investment, the initial investment, but we also know that digital revolution is going to uh, improve the asset management. So both on the construction cost and the operating cost, both onshore and offshore wind is going to be competitive and continue to be competitive. So we are very confident that if you consider average market price, we will be a clean, affordable source of energy. The problem with the market regulation is that the more renewable power you put when the wind blows, the less value our customers are getting from the wind assets because technically it's simple. The gas turbine can hold and wait for the price to be high to produce, but the wind blows and the wind blows on all onshore and offshore wind turbines and therefore the prices are collapsing at the time we produce. So there is an intrinsic paradox where the more we do the right thing, same thing for storage, renewable power or storage are killing the value of what is supposed to be the right thing to do. So what we believe is that you can uh, either let the market play, but with a fair market, which would put a price on carbon, which is the should the market dry, we need to be penalizing with a carbon price all the fossil fuel that can hold the production and come at the opportunistic time on the, on the market. But for all the renewable and clean assets, or for storage assets that are going to just play with the difference of when the electricity is low, uh, you load the battery or the, you produce hydrogen, and when you have high price, you actually inject into the grid. That difference is collapsing the more you do storage. So if we want the market to drive, we need to have a carbon price. Otherwise, we need to have a minimum minimum protected system that we believe contract for difference can be the right answer because the strike price will be anyway be below below the average power market price. Mm -hmm. Hans Dieter, I think we've won the argument that wind is cheap in terms of levelized cost of electricity. We haven't yet won the argument everywhere on the costs of system integration. What are you doing in Anacon to make it easier and cheaper to integrate wind in the energy system? Uh, in the heart of Enercon, we think about a completely uh, wind included uh, for our customer with a storage system and, and so on for, for, because we work on the intelligent wind turbine and we work now for, for in our area where we live with a utility EWE together to, to bring in the next five years 280,000 people in the completely green area with smart grids and, and, and so on with heating pumps. and. And it was very impressed to, to see the uh, Danish videos, and it's fantastic to see it on the video. But uh, what we work on Enercon is that we can step into a car, make an uh, electric mobility car, and then we drive to some hardware to see it. I think that is a, that we must understand that we now, in the next two three years, we must show the people and the politicians that it works. And Enercon is uh, working a lot of. Um, um, bring ideas into the market, but we are not alone on this planet, and we think that also on this uh, fair, uh, many, many ideas are there, and, and we must bring it to the market and, and show the people it works. And I think that is uh, wind turbine manufacturers, wind turbine manufacturer, and, and we can bring the uh, wind turbines for sure, but without the ideas behind that we cannot sell turbines for the future. That is not only in Germany, that is also if you bring your wind turbines to Uganda or whatever, you must have the ideas what has happened with the electricity after that. And also Enercon is also working for the for a new turbine generation for the south of Germany. We, there's another typical system, low wind speed and so on. And that is also very important because in, in the next two, three years, we need more wind turbines 
in the south of Germany because the grid is free and so on. And for, uh, one sentence is also for the growing in Germany, it's, it, was, it would be very helpful if uh, the Berlin can make a decision about the new repowering situation in Germany. In the next three, five years, we, lost, we, are, we, we will lose more than 10,000 megawatt of all old onshore wind turbines. And we can double the kilowatt hours if we have an idea for quicker repowering. And so we win a lot of, of space for, for, for grid installation and so on. Mm. Anya, what are you doing in E.ON to help make repowering happen? I mean, of course, it's, it's a, it's a um, reality already today because our, all our fleets are aging and basically there are always two options. Either you basically look into lifetime extension. That can, that can be commercially interesting because we also fueled by digitization, uh, the sensors, the information we have now component by component, we can make a much more solid assessment. Let's say how long will a component and ultimately the, um, the equipment last. Um, clearly as an alternative, we always look also into um, repowering um, and uh, the, there are two various versions of repowering, but what we do typically in Europe is really to, to tear down the whole asset and to rebuild it. And I think um, my colleague here has already explained why it's so beneficial because basically you replace small turbines by turbines which are double or triple the size of what you had uh, installed before but clearly the challenge is permitting um, so although the opportunity is enormous um, uh, also in terms of potentially NIMBY issues um, because we have already let's say those assets installed and the infrastructure is, is there um, sometimes it's very very difficult to repower because um, permitting doesn't allow you to do it, uh, then you have basically to comply with the distance rules, etc., etc. So I think we, uh, we need political support to really assess the situation and make the right decisions, because this could be an easy, in, in a way, an easy booster to the installed capacity on land, because mm -hmm. uh, it's short permitting times, existing infrastructure, we could simply do it, go mm -hmm. and do it. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Anya. Ladies and gentlemen, at 11.40, the chairman of Wind Europe, Ivor Cato, is going to be presenting this report that we've been talking about, breaking new ground, solutions for electrification, how it can be done, the impact that it can have, how much it will cost. That's 11.40 in here. Uh, there'll be some other great speakers on that panel. Torsten Herden, who you've heard from already. The CEO of Zaft Batteries, one of Europe's leading battery ma manufacturers, will be on the panel as well. So 11.40 in this room. Before I close for a short break, before then, please, warm round of applause for our three event ambassadors. Well done.